Let's stand together and join in our call to worship. Come to the mountain and worship the Lord. As the disciples encounter Jesus in a new way, let us open ourselves to a new encounter with him. Jesus is the one come from God who makes all things new. Praise the name of Jesus, and may we honor him in all we say and do. We'll sing our hymn of praise this morning, number 173, Christ whose glory fills the skies. Let's all share in the Transfiguration Prayer this morning, found on page 259 of your hymnal. Let us pray these words together. Holy God, upon the mountain you revealed our Messiah, who by his death and resurrection would fulfill both the law and the prophets. By his transfiguration, enlighten our path that we may dare to suffer with him in the service of humanity, and so share in the everlasting glory of him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning again. A wonderful privilege as a body and family of Christ is to participate in the holy sacrament of baptism. As you greet one another and then be seated, we'll invite the Crawford family forward this morning. Call your attention to the chorus there in your bulletin. At the conclusion of the ritual, as our response to this family, we'll share 
the chorus, God Claims You. First of all, we want to present with, uh, to them this blanket made by our Peacemakers Ministry here at our church. We present this uh, handmade uh, blanket to you as a symbol of our love, as our warmth enfolds you on this journey. You do not raise your child alone. Every day we will blanket you with our care. Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God and this holy privilege must never be denied them. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus when he said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Beloved, do you, in presenting this child for holy baptism, confess your own faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? If so, we do. Do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before this child a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care that he be brought up in the Christian faith, be taught the holy scriptures, and learn to give reverent attendance upon the private and public worship of God? If so, we do. And will you endeavor to keep this child under the ministry and guidance of the church, until he, by the power of God, shall accept for himself the gift of salvation and be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's holy church. If so, we will. The waters of baptism have long been in the Christian tradition a symbol of cleansing, a symbol of growth, a symbol of new life, a symbol of nourishment. God's grace poured out for all people. What name is given this child? Carter James. All right, old buddy, here we go. This is Carter James. This is Carter James. This is Carter James. Carter James, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you bow with me in prayer? God, our Heavenly Father, grant that Carter James, as he grows in years, may also grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that by the restraining and renewing influence of your Holy Spirit, he may ever truly be your child and serve you faithfully all of his days. Guide and uphold Tyler and Olivia, that through loving care, wise counsel, and holy example, they may lead him into that life of faith whose strength is righteousness and whose fruit is everlasting joy and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As our response to this family, look at the chorus there in your bulletin. We'll use his name, Carter James. We'll sing the refrain, verse 1, verse 2, and then the refrain again. Amen. Just as we have extended the grace and promises of our Lord to this family and reminded one another of those promises, uh, we have the opportunity to extend the promises of God to all people when we take the time to worship the Lord together in giving. 
There are several opportunities for ministry and mission listed there in the bulletin. Please take note of those. Large announcement in the bulletin. Please uh, kind of check mark it if you would. Ash Wednesdays, this Wednesday, the Lenten season begins. We will begin here with our Ash Wednesday service this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We hope that you be with us. Uh, it's a very sacred and solemn time, very important time as a church to begin this Lenten journey together this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Also, we continue to sign folks up to serve at the Clarksburg Mission for the meals on the third Sunday or the second Thursday. Uh, that information is on the whiteboard in the main porch entry. Uh, consider as a family, a small group, a group of friends getting together and serving one of those meals. It really is not a difficult task, uh, but you will find it a very rewarding task to serve there at the Clarksburg Mission. This coming Saturday will be our confirmation day apart. Uh, if you've not uh, signed up or know of someone that needs to, those are sixth graders and youth older than that who have not yet become members of the church. If they would like to explore that with us, we'll be here this Saturday. Just let us know as soon as you can this week about their attendance. We will be receiving some other members of our church uh, coming up in March. If you are interested in being recognized as a member, we would love to hear from you. You can fill out your contact information uh, fully there on the attendance pad, and someone will be in touch with you about that very special time. Other announcements there, the prayer request cards, the blue cards in your pew, you can make specific requests there, and our prayer stewards collect those and make intercession on our behalf. With that in mind, the ushers will come. We'll receive the Lord's tithes and our offerings as we hear, let us with a joyful mind praise our God forever kind. <laughs> Before we present our offerings, let's stand and affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, number 881 in our hymnals. We'll follow that by singing the doxology this morning, number 94 in our hymnals. As God's people, let us join with generations of Christians who have gone before us in stating our basic beliefs. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We live in a world, O Lord, that proclaims with both hurt and anger, Did you see me? Did you see me when I was hungry? Did you see me, that stranger that you passed by? Did you see me in need of shelter? Did you see me when I ended up in prison? Receive our gifts this day, O Lord, that your church, both here in Bridgeport and around the world, can look into the eyes of those in need and proclaim with caring, we see you. And although your weeping may last a night time, we are here to tell you joy cometh in the morning. Strengthen us to proclaim into the home's way too quiet, we see you weeping. But oh yes, joy cometh in the morning. Grant us the compassion to proclaim to the attic, I see you, in all of your rage and in all of your pain, and yes, I weep with you for a night time, but believe that joy cometh in the morning. Grant us the gentleness to say to the sick and to the grieving, I see you, I love you. I promise that while we may weep for a night time, God promises that joy cometh in the morning. And in this sanctuary, where maybe we sit today feeling unworthy and hoping beyond hope that no one sees us, proclaim boldly through your church this living body of Christ, I see you, it's okay, it is morning, amen. Let us join together in hymn 393, Spirit of the Living God, we will sing this through twice this morning.
Thank you. you. May be seated. Our choirs come to share our wordy music. The powerful and vital words are printed there in your bulletin. You can follow along as we hear together, lift your eyes. On this Transfiguration Sunday, I call your attention to the scripture lesson, Matthew 17, that records these events on what has come to be known as the Mount of Transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the brothers, James and John, with him. They went up on a very high mountain where they could be alone. 
There in front of the disciples, Jesus was completely changed. His face was shining like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. All at once, Moses and Elijah were there talking with Jesus. So Peter said to him, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter was still speaking, the shadow of a bright cloud passed over them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my own dear son, and I am pleased with him. Listen to what he says. When the disciples heard the voice, they were so afraid that they fell flat on the ground. But Jesus came over and touched them. He said, Get up and don't be afraid. When they opened their eyes, they saw only Jesus. On their way down from the mountain, Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the Son of Man had been raised from death. This is God's word for us today. I can still hear the chorus in the small church in Nicholas County in which I was raised, a song that they sang together frequently. But the chorus repeated the phrase, Jesus will outshine them all. Jesus will outshine them all. And the verses described all kinds of varying experiences of life, mountaintop experiences, valley experiences, but then the chorus chimed in, Jesus will outshine them all. Peter and the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration encountered a shining Jesus. He was transfigured, brightened, lightened before them. They wanted to stay on the mountain. It was such a wonderful experience. But Jesus said, no, we're not going to stay here. We've got work to do in the valley. And I think he was basically saying to the disciples, and he would say to us, I want you to understand how I can shine in your life, whether you're on the mountain or whether you're in the valley. It's my prayer for you this morning, my friends, that you would discover a faith that is such that regardless of the circumstances and experiences that you may have, that you will find Jesus can outshine them all. For example, in your most shining and glowing moments, I pray that Jesus will outshine them all. You know, those moments when we feel that we've really achieved something, those moments where we're sort of maybe basking in our success, Those moments in which we feel life is on the mountaintop and everything's glowing and shiny. The danger in that is in those moments we sometimes start to turn inward to ourselves and sort of congratulate ourselves. We can easily become self-centered during those shining, glowing times. When we hear the applause of others, it's so enticing. And it's easy not to remain humble. But friends, if you would discover a faith that would see you through all things, you would find that even in your brightest moments, your shining moments, we are called to allow Jesus to outshine them all. Sometimes you wonder in church whether small children learn anything from the older crowd that's here. I wondered that in a little church, one of the first churches I served, there probably weren't more than 25 people that attended on a good Sunday. Because there was an elderly gentleman right around 90 years old in that congregation. And about every other week, he always wanted to sing a solo. A cappella always. He had his own notebook full of hymns. And he would stand up and and sing something about every other week. And people were appreciative. Why? Well, here he is, 90 years old. And my goodness, he's singing the praises of God. Why wouldn't you be impressed with that? What an impression. And so, inevitably, when he would stop singing his song... The congregation would applaud. And he always said this way, he put his hands out, he said, Now that's okay. But remember, it's God and only God. That was his way of saying, It's not me. It's the glory to the glory of God. Well, we had three or four children at most in that little church. And one Sunday they organized them. They were going to sing a song in church. And so the four or five kids, they stood up there and they, they sang their song. And, of course, we were just thrilled to have a few kids. And after they sang the song, of course, the congregation. And I can remember there was a little boy about five years old, not more than five. And he stepped out of line and he said, that's okay. But just remember, 
It's God. Friends, he'd gotten it right. Watching that older gentleman, those week in and week out, he had learned, indeed, the humility of discipleship. Even in our moments when we think we might deserve some applause, those shining, glowing moments, I pray that you will allow Jesus to outshine them all. Secondly, using some other shine language, when we are tempted to cut a shine, May we allow Jesus to outshine them all. Now, I can't speak for you, but what that meant in my household was boisterous, unruly, sometimes tantrum-like behavior. You know, as a child, I would throw my tantrums trying to get my way, and my mother would say, it will do you no good to cut a shine, young man. It will do you no good. Now, we think we've sort of put away childish ways, I suppose. But I say in this boisterous society in which we live, How often we are tempted to sort of join in with the toxic talk. We're sort of tempted to join in, to chime in, to go off on somebody, to be angry, to have some hate language that maybe I can add in there. Everybody else is, why can't I cut a shine myself? Get right in there in the fray. Well, friends, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we're called to speak a different language than that of our world. And the only way we'll do that, the only way we'll overcome the temptation to cut a shine, is to allow Jesus to outshine all things in our life. Some years ago, I read a story, Brad Newcomb, he was raised in the hills of Kentucky. He said he was 14, his brother was about a year older, 15. He said they got into a terrible scuffle one time as siblings sometimes do, but this was bad. Name calling, I hate you, I wish you'd never been born, all of those kind of things. And he said, unfortunately, our dad caught us. And so he said to us, boys, I've put this off for a long time, but it's time we take a trip to the mountain. Newcomb says, I wasn't sure what he meant, but we started hiking. And we hiked to the back side of the farm, up on a mountain, up on a little mount. And there, as is often the case in West Virginia and Kentucky, there was a family cemetery up on the mount. And he said, we followed in silence, and finally we found ourselves standing by a grave with a small marker. And it read, Samuel Newcomb, one month old. He says his dad looked at him and said, boys, this would have been your older brother. Six years before you even came along, we loved him, and we love you. So the next time that you want to use the word hate in talking to your brother, you think about this, and you think about love, and you think about the life that you do have. Newcomb goes on to say, even when we were tempted which we were many times, to utter those words. It was that trip to the mount with the family cemetery that caused us to have a different perspective. Their dad was trying to teach them something very important, that there is a larger perspective to be had. And when we are tempted to soil ourselves in the difficult times in which we live with hateful language and mean-spirited talk and all sorts of words that do not belong in Christian vocabulary, may we allow Jesus to so shine in our lives that we will see that larger perspective and be the people that he's called us to be. Now, I know it's not easy, friends. I know it's not easy to stand for Jesus who is all about love and it says here in the scripture his clothes became white as light. He's about love and light and life. Those L words are hard to pronounce in our world. Love and light and life. I can remember when my kids were small they were not unlike other children. They had a little trouble developing the L sound. You know that's a difficult one for little kids. And so sometimes they would substitute for the L. 
So instead of love, it would come out love. Instead of look, it would be wook until they developed it. I had a speech pathologist in another one of my churches, and she said, actually, that's very common. The L sound is difficult to teach, but you teach it by showing them how to control their tongue. You put the tip of the tongue behind the front, upper front teeth. Love, light, life. Well, I guess I knew that, but what she, the way she said it has always stuck with me. Because when it comes to pronouncing love and light and life in our world, how often does it come down to how we control our tongue? We can choose to speak words that hurt, or we can speak words that heal. We can speak words that lift people up, or we can speak words that put them down. We can choose to hold our tongue from time to time. And that may actually help in pronouncing the L, love, light, life. This, my friends, is the Christian call to let words lift one another up. So when you're tempted to join in with the boisterous times in which we live to cut a shine, look into Jesus and let him outshine them all. Finally, a little more shine language. When life leaves you with a shiner, may you find that Jesus will outshine them all. All of us have had our various black eye experiences in life because life's not easy. Life from time to time leaves us hurt and wounded and broken. But amidst those times, friends, we can, like the disciples, see Jesus Know his light and allow him to shine even amidst the dark times in which we live. I I can remember when I served the church in Morgantown showing up to preach one Sunday with one of the biggest black eyes that I'd ever had in my life. I'm sad to say I've had a few through the years. But there I was standing in the pulpit, my eyes swollen, completely black all the way around. I'm sure the congregation wondered where in the world has the preacher been this week. I was tempted to use that old line, you know, you should see the other guy. Or, you should see the Baptist preacher. (laughs) After we got into it. But, no, I didn't. Because what had happened is I'd been in that Saturday a good old-fashioned game of one-on-one basketball with my son. And he'd made a hard head fake. And I didn't go for it. And his head pummeled me right in the eye, knocking me completely down, in fact instantly swelling and turning black and blue. And so that Sunday, I stood up with a black eye to preach about the love of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, to tell you the truth, you just can't see it all the time. But every time, every time I stand to preach, I'm standing to preach with some black eyes that I've had along the way. And the fact is, every time you come to worship, you're gathered in this place with your share of black eyes. Because we know what it is to be hurt. We know what it is to be broken. We know what it is to be in grief. We know what it is to experience the darkness of despair. But friends, when life leaves you with that, may you allow Jesus to outshine them all. Because he can make the difference amidst all of those experiences. Closing, previous church that I served, it was summertime, the choir was on break, and so we had scheduled some soloists. A lady was scheduled to sing a solo that Sunday. Well, her mother died that week. In fact, her mother's visitation was Sunday at 2 with the funeral on Monday morning. And so I called around Thursday, and I said, you know, I know it's been a very difficult week for you. And I know the services are Sunday and Monday, so why don't you just let us get someone else to sing? We'll do another one. We take a break, step away. And I can still hear her voice coming back through the phone. Why wouldn't I sing? She said. Almost matter of fact, but with a resolute faith. Why wouldn't I sing? She said. And so she did. 
right in the midst of the darkness of grief. This is what she sang. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Tempted and tried, I need a great Savior, one who can help my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, oh, I must tell Jesus, He all my cares and sorrows will share. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. There she was, right in the face of the grief, singing out, I must tell Jesus, Jesus alone. Friends, whether you find yourself on the mountain or in the valley, a shining, glowing moment, a tempting moment to cut a shine, or life just leaves you hurt, some black eyes along the way, know that Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus alone can outshine them all. Let us pray. Lord, even as the disciples saw Jesus shining brightly before them, we pray that you would show us the way to experience the radiancy of his light each day of our journey, wherever our journey leads. Show us the way to follow and to keep looking to Jesus, that he in all things might outshine them all. In his name we pray. Amen. Know that our altar rail is always available for prayer if you've been asked to pray on behalf of another. If there's a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of commitment, a prayer of dedication, a rededication, know that you can Do that in the context of worship today. Our side hallways lead up to our altar rail. You certainly can make your prayer where you are. In the Faith We Sing supplement, it's really telling us again the story of the transfiguration. Let's stand as we share 2103, We Have Come at Christ's Own Bidding.
been good to be in the house of the Lord on this day. We remind you of our Ash Wednesday service this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We hope that you can be with us for this very important and sacred service. We hope you know already that you've given witness to the power of God's kingdom in our world by choosing to be present in worship. In today's culture, that already is a testimony. Friends, we have many and varied experiences in life. Sometimes we'll be on the mountain. Sometimes we'll be in the valley. But Jesus promises through his light that he can outshine them all. We receive that good news. We go forth to share. In his name, we depart to serve. Amen. Amen.